Welcome to the Nature Journal Club. So today, um, first just a little explanation. If you notice, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm, I'm short hair today. Hi, Welcome, sorry. good to see you. Um, the, uh, the other day, my daughter Amelia um, explained to me that um, she's really good at cutting hair. <laughs> and so I figured, you know, what, what could possibly go wrong um, <laughs> <laughs> and and so she um, she got out some a, a, a razor and some scissors and, and and we we went to town. It was it was really fun, um, but just so you know, want to let everybody know that should um, anybody need a haircut, um, I'm now a, a shill for um, Amelia's hair salon, and um, uh, everything can ultimately be solved um, by um, uh, taking it all the way down then to base level. Um, so, thank you, thank you. Um, which is also kind of appropriate for today's topic, um, because today we're going to be talking about drawing all the ugly critters. Um, so, ugly is a value judgment, which basically means it's a critter that has some strange proportions that we're just not used to, so it just looks wrong. But if we kind of lean into some of the ugly critters, uh, several things happen. One, they're no longer ugly anymore. They're like, oh wow, that's really cool, that's really fascinating. Um, and there's also, because they're, they're just sort of weird in their proportions, um, when, you, when you look at them, you can learn something really interesting by like, if you can figure out what it is that is making a critter look ugly or different than everything else, um, that's gonna help you be able to draw whatever it is. So we're gonna start off with, with my buddies, the hyenas. Hyenas get a really, really bad rap. If you've seen The Lion King, Right? That is just a propaganda piece for lions. Um, and in that, like, you know, the, 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 the hyenas are the bad guys, they're scavengers, they're, they're lowly. Um, these guys do awesome hunting on their own, and often lions will steal the kills from them. So those scavenging lions. Um, but they, they just look weird. They look really, really weird. They always kind of have a slightly worried expression. And long, it looks like somebody kind of crossed a giraffe with a dog, and so they've got these really long necks. The proportions of them just, they, they feel off. Um, they're uh, behaviorally utterly fascinating. They live in these social clans led by females, so these big matrilineal, these big matriarchal posses of hyenas running around out there. Um, so I, you know, I think it would be interesting if somebody wanted to do like, you know, Lion King hyenas versus, you know, you can take a look at the, you know, there's the great example like the patriarchy lions versus the, the matriarchy here with the, you know, this is a, this is a little male hyena showing submissive posture to a couple of females that are just kind of walking by. Um, but these are spotted hyenas. They're really really cool critters, and if we take all the fluff off of them, um, skeletally, we've got really long front. Long in the front, a little bit shorter in the back, um, but also very high in the shoulders. And they have this strangely long, 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 long neck. So anytime you are, you're doing the work with a really long neck, if you have a, a long arm on something, you know, it takes more effort at this end to, to, to move it. So if you have a really long neck, your skull is getting heavier out there. And then if you try to, you know, tear off the, the haunch of a wildebeest, that's putting extreme pressures on your neck. So that's why there are these big processes over the shoulder here. And what those are, are attachment points for ligaments that go out onto the neck like that to help hold this whole neck up. So the architecture of, of a hyena is really a, it's a, it's a fascinating thing. And if you put the, the fur on top of these, you can see that the, the fur kind of just sits on, on top of these. They've got kind of a deep body, long, thick, muscular neck. On all the legs, actually, before I kind of, I'm gonna back up just one moment. So on this, I just wanna point out that this anatomy that we're looking at, there you see very similar thing on cats, dogs, lots of critters that we're familiar with. And, it's the same basic anatomy that is underneath the human skin. Um, so if you look at this, this is the hip, this is the knee, this is the heel up here off the ground. So they're standing up on their toes. These bones here 
are your um, metatarsal bones, those ones that go across the instep of your foot. All right, those, those five little bones here. So here um, it's got its, those, those, those metatarsal bones. And up here, this is your shoulder, your elbow. This is the wrist down here. And then these bones across the back of the hand. That's what makes this little fan coming down here. So this is sort of mapping the similar anatomy as a human being, but we're just up on our toes. When we put the meat on the bones, the general rule of thumb is that the closer you are to the core of the body, the more meat there is. That's where the big sort of bulk of the muscles is. So um, up in here, we've got you know, the big section, the medium section, and the littler section. So as you go down the leg, you're getting smaller. And if we look at that with a little bit more nuance, it's going from wide to narrow, from wide to narrow, and this is just narrow. So even within one of these sections, the widest part of it is towards the top, closer to the body. And you see the same thing on a human's uh, body. You know, here I'm skinny, here there's more meat, here there's even more meat. So as you go more proximal to the core, you're getting, the, the, the limb is getting wider, as you're getting more distal, it's getting just narrow and narrow and narrow. And you see that on all the limbs. So um, here you have wide, and here you have narrower and narrower. Um, you're gonna see this pattern across a large number of, of mammals. Anything that has to kind of move a limb is gonna have this approach. The last thing I wanna point out here is the general, just the angles of these limbs themselves. The front leg is a vertical column. And the purpose of that is to to sort of its support, it's holding up uh, this part of the body has to hold more body weight than the back, right? And also, the purpose of the back leg is it's bent. It is this spring for thrusting you forward. So this is the power. So the back leg is sort of coming down to the knee, right? It's bent. Front leg is a vertical column. And you're gonna see this on lots of critters. And if the elbow and knee height is here, then um, of, the, of, the, of the body is there, then what you're seeing on the bottom of the body, kind of the quick and dirty quadruped, quick sketch, is front leg straight down, back leg is coming back, And people think that this is, oh, this must be this sort of weird backwards facing knee. But again, the knee's up here, that's just the normal facing heel. I should have made this a little bit longer to be one of these guys. There we go. So that's the, some anatomy that is underlying the things. And I put the color and spots on it, and it's a, it's a cute little critter. These guys often look really rough and kind of scraggly. Um, the spot patterns on them are going to be really variable. It's, it's a signature of each individual hyena has their own pattern of spots, so no two are the same. Um, when you're putting spots on a critter, just a few thoughts on spots, is you want to think about the body as being essentially a cylinder. And spots on the side of the body that are pointing towards you, you're gonna see those as being rounded. Spots that are getting closer to the top and rolling off the side, you're seeing those as flattened. Because it's being foreshortened away from you. 
Um, if I look at Here's my hyena spot on the side of a jar, right? One's facing towards you, you see as round. As that rocks up and is facing up, you then see that as more of an ellipse. So you can help your drawing have a sense of being rounded by ones up here, those show, those are going to be ones closer towards the side are going to become more of a line as they're pointing away from the viewer. Again, there's just different spots on different critters. Some areas you're gonna see sort of more of a trend, kind of these are even making lines um, the thing to be aware of, uh, wary of when you're putting spots on any critter is that know that when we kind of start drawing dots in on a critter, your brain will want to put them much more symmetrically. Even if you're kind of not lining them up, your brain will tend to make them the same size and, you know, and spacing apart. And you'll sort of see a gap and your brain will want to put one in there. And the result is that it doesn't end up looking random. Um, randomness is clumpy. So when you look at sort of random sets of things, there will be streaks of the same thing in there together. So that means if you're putting in, you want some spots or whatever it is to be random, rather than you want some of them to be places where there, there are gonna be clusters. And other places where there are gaps. Other places where they may be more evenly, but then there'll be other places where there are clusters. And so think about that as you're spotting your critters. We have just be aware of the tendency to want to kind of go and you get things that look too kind of polka dotted and cartoonish. Then on a really biological critter, there may be sort of patterns within that. So for instance, here, this one is larger, darker spotting on the back. Some of them appearing in lines. You see the same thing going on on that one there. If, by the way, you get your spots in the wrong place on your hyena, just tell everybody you're drawing a different hyena. <laughs> so there's no, there's no uh, one set of spots. Um, let's just try, though, making a sketch here. This set of four critters in the same pose, it actually is gonna be really useful for helping us kind of think about making an initial preliminary sketch. I'm gonna show you when I, be, when I draw a critter, kind of my general order of operations on getting the critter down on paper. Um, I start with more general lines and then I move towards more careful, precise lines and kind of fill in details. One of the things I find most useful is just the flow of the back and neck of whatever critter it is that I'm looking at. So that's often my first line. Then I look at you know, how, how far down is the belly of this thing. Look on this one, I wonder if this is pregnant. Like this one is much deeper bodied than this one here. Maybe it's just had its big meal or it could be pregnant. See also this one fairly deep body, that one about in the middle. So I'm looking at this proportion, and then I'm looking at the proportion from there. If that's going to be that long, what's then the distance to the ground? Um, if you, you know, just draw your body in, and then you start drawing in legs, and you're focusing on those sort of things, you end up, because you're so focused on legs, that you you'll kind of miss these sort of proportioning of the critters. And you can see how important that is for drawing whatever individual you're actually looking at. So lines that I find very helpful, you know, how big is it, how far down is the ground. And then a, another step that I find is absolute gold is to 
look at the shape of the air underneath the two front legs. And this is gonna be, kind of, first it's gonna sound kind of weird, and then it'll see like, ooh, I think I can use this. So what I'm talking about is I'm looking at this shape of the air comes up, it comes up, and down like that. So I've got a shape here like that. What I do is I'm gonna put that shape in on my critter, and that does several things. One, it gets the leg in the right positions, but it also is gonna get the legs to be the right distance apart. If you have your critter and you work on drawing one leg, you then kind of work on drawing the other leg, what very often happens is because you're focusing on leg, leg, you'll get legs that look right, but they'll either be too far apart or more often too close together. So if early on you just look at this negative shape here, that's going to block in your legs, and then you know you can essentially frame in your critter around them. For blocking in the location of the head, I usually do a circle box technique. So here's roughly my head, and here, and then I will stick a box out from that. Different sorts of critters will have snouts of different lengths, so. You know, I might be making a lion, right? Or I might be making a jackal. So, it's also a lot easier if you're just tracing on top of a projected image. <laughs> um, so I admit that this is easier than sort of doing it freehand. But these are the things I'm thinking about when I'm kind of freehanding. So you see how just with a few lines, you've got a lot of information. Um, these three marks, this negative shape, gives you a ton of fast information. Um, for drawing heads, I'm going to show you some tricks on that, and then we'll have a chance to do a little bit of sketching um, from some photographs. For drawing heads, we're going to look at the head from the front. I think of that ball of the cranium, and then with the, the snout sticking out from that. Before I put that in, keeping kind of a central axis of your head is going to be useful. If it's looking straight on you, I want this side to be um, symmetrical with this side. But also, if the head is turned, then this point becomes really, really helpful, the, the line between the two sides. Um, but here, even just a front view, it's going to be um, useful for me. So here's my little snout. And then I imagine a line going across through the eyes. I want those eyes to be parallel. You see people do this with drawings of human faces all the time. You, want those, you don't want one eye high, one eye low. You want those eyes parallel to each other. This is a line across the top of the nose and where the mouth goes in, so that when I'm putting those in, I don't have kind of a cubist critter with a, you know, a, a, a crooked smile. If you kind of come to draw your ears, everybody focuses on the ears, but not the space between the ears. And so um, the danger with just sort of drawing the ears, and let's say here's my head, and people sort of draw, you know, here's a little hyena ear, you'll get these, but the distance between these won't be right. So is it on the top of the head like that? Um, or is it wider? So looking at the negative shape between those ears is going to be helpful. Hyenas have a little crest going down the center of their head because their skull has a little shark fin like ridge. So for give you kind of more space for jaw attachment. And so that from the front, a hyena has is going to have at the right angle a little W on top of their head. So that's using that negative shape again. And then I'll bring my ears down from there. On this critter, the ear comes in at the same height as the eyes. Um, I used to think that I could memorize, you know, like what is, you know, for a hyena, what is the kind of formula for like the heights of these lines and things? Um, and how is that different for a horse? But it turns out, that the placement of all those lines on one single kind of animal will be radically different if the animal just does this or this. 
So you think about here, the bottom of the ears lines up with the eye, right? Um, so the eyes are here in the front of the head, the ears are attaching in further behind the eyes. So if I've got my eyes and my ears here, if this animal looks down a little bit, right, then the ears are going to appear higher than the eyes. And if it looks up, it could be the opposite way. So if this critter looked down more, its eyes would be down here relative to where those ears come in. So there isn't a formula that you can memorize for kind of proportions of, of, of the hyena. And when you see diagrams like this, just be aware that this is just going to be relative to what is this animal doing with its head at this moment. Same thing true for humans, same thing true for whatever it is that you want to draw. A few other um, things I want to point out on this drawing. Um, to make your animal faces look better, a very important part is how do the eyes fit into the head. And what people will tend to do is if here's my head, they'll just kind of we'll get these eyes just sort of floating out there, or sometimes you know they've got little lines you know, coming towards the inside corner. But you'll have these eyes that feel like they're just sort of floating in this in space in the head. In humans, our eye sockets are these big deep recesses. If you look at your dogs, your cats, um, your hyenas, lots of other critters, the eyes are more on the outside and they're not in these big recessed cavities like they are on primates. So um, to protect those eyes a little bit, there is sort of an area of tissue that is going to be up and around those eyes, bigger on the top, a little bit smaller on the bottom there. And getting that zone of that sort of raised stuff around the edge of the eyes really helps kind of place those eyes into the head. So I'm going to put a few little kind of tick marks on those just to kind of to stitch them into the, into the face. Another thing that I'm doing here that is sort of is worth mentioning is to make this look a little bit shaggy. What I do is not just kind of draw little lines out like this, and so now it's shaggy. This tends to look like it got attacked by a porcupine. At a distance, you're not often not seeing hair, 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 hair. But instead, you're seeing the edges of overlapping clumps of hair. So what, the way I suggest that is if I have one big clump of hair here and there's another uh, piece that it's um, overlapping, is often on the edge where these come together, you'll get a crack between those that will be bigger towards the outside and then get smaller towards the inside. So rather than thinking of drawing a hair sticking out, think about drawing a crack in the fur sticking in. So get your pencil in there, kind of wiggle it and flick it in. Wiggle it and flick it in. And you'll get these things that feel like these cracks in the fur, like that. So I've got some of these going on here. I've got some of these things kind of going on here. And you, know, you put in a few of those, and the thing starts to feel much more fuzzy, or, or that, it's got, that it's got thick fur, rather than this, that it, it has a bunch of little pins sticking out of it. When you do those, don't make them placed symmetrically, or it'll feel like a picket fence. So some are bigger, some are smaller. Right? There are gaps between them. A few of these, and it will fluff the thing up. But if you put it all over, it's, it's not going to work. Similarly, with a few little on the edge, you can then also add a few little tick marks every once in a while to cross the line. But if you, on the edge of your ear, you just start putting a lot of these things in like that, it then feels like fence posts or a zipper. And um, that's not the effect that you want. A little bit of suggestion of it will be a lot more effective. So let's take a look at some real hyena faces. Oh, this is kind of cool. Notice on this one here, 
that the level of the eyes and the level of where the ears come in are not now on the same level. Huh. And that's because this one is looking up a little bit. If it looked down, the eyes would be on this side of the line. Instead of going bottom of the ears and the eyes, it would be the other way. But just choose, oh, so I'm just, I'm gonna, let's take a look at some of those little flick marks. Like along this edge right here, I would be kind of going in and flicking in, coming in, flicking in, coming in, flick, flick, coming in, flicking in. All right? In here, there's thicker fur, bigger flick, bigger flick, um, uh, smaller fur. All right? Gives you just a sense of that there's some shaggy going on there. Let's take a moment and just um, draw up some hyena face. Think about what the, the, the guidelines that I showed are not the ones that, you're, that you have to use, but just play with it a little bit and see, kind of block in some basic lines and then see if you can shag it up a little bit. And um, also uh, kind of be aware of this kind of clump of tissue above the eye and below the eye and how that makes the eye sort of feel like it's placed in the skull. You want a suggestion of that. Lastly, be sure to get these sort of dark marks in here. They just make the, the, uh, the, 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 the hyena has this expression of kind of attentive indifference. It's just wonderful. Um, so let's just take a few minutes and copy this and play with play with that. with some of those fur edges. I call those little wedges Bill Berry marks. Uh, William D. Berry is my, um, my favorite illustrator. And uh, if you look through his sketchbooks, he's constantly making these little marks in places that are really strategic to kind of fluff out his critters without making them. They look like they have a pelt rather than fuzzy. And uh, if you're interested in really improving your mammal drawings, I would get his book, Alaskan Field Sketches. You can still find this. It's out of print, but you can find it a few places online. Alaskan Field Sketches. It's outstanding, really inspiring pencil sketches of um, Alaskan mammals and some places. Just uh, play this with this for about a minute more. This is not time to finish this drawing, but it's time to give yourself a chance to kind of mess with some of these ideas. And how would you lay it out? So if you're watching this at home, you can pause the video. 
and uh, keep it on there as long as you like. And when you're ready, hit play again and go on. Here's another hyena. This time we get that full body. Again, think about what we did before with the back and belly in the ground. And this negative shape. Up, down, slight up here. And it's going to be a longer down slope and down. You're going to find that as you kind of go around a shape like that, it sometimes helps to say out loud, like, you know, up straight, little jog in, flat, then flat, then up at an angle talk it out. Every time you're saying a different angle, your brain is going to have to kind of work with that and go like, oh, you're making a different, you're noticing a different angle, I'm going to have to change the direction of my line. Let's take three minutes or so and make a sketch of this guy. Then when you kind of get to the right point, you can even you know, put in some suggestions of shaggy fur. Often this area you get big shag. Very often you get big shag on the back edge of the leg. And these hyenas have this sort of mat of shag right down there. Those are some good shag spots to direct your attention to. working, let me just sort of point out an approach that I was doing earlier. I used to kind of think, I draw in the whole line of the back, sort of block in the body and block in the head, and then figure out the length of the legs, and then put in your negative shape. I think that this order of operations, top, belly, ground, and then to, to put the negative shape in here, And then say, all right, if it's there, then here's where my body's going to be. Is going is 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 even more useful um, because it then lets you really get this negative shape. If you had done this, I, have, I find I have a tendency to make the the length of space between my legs fit whatever body I had put in. But if I haven't made a commitment to that yet, and I'm drawing in my negative shape here. I can put that in. So this negative shape is a very, very useful thing. But experiment with it. There's no rule on it. Figure out what works for you. That's what I've been doing recently. And this critter is going to wander away in about a minute. Do this enough, and you're going to start to love hyenas. A lot of things that we find ugly, a lot of the things that we find scary, a big part of that is just that we're not familiar with those critters. And the more we kind of give them some attention, they just start to look cool. Instead of like, eh, you go, ooh. And the more oohs rather than ehs, the better off you are. So another thing, critter, that makes a lot of people kind of go, eh, there's something wrong with this, is the wildebeest. 
Wilt beasts, they're like all angles and corners, and and they're just weird. But they're like this this keystone element of the the Serengeti. They're they're fascinating, really rugged, sturdy beasties. So here's one of the here's a sturdy beastie. But look at this, they've like, got this weird beard going on, mane, sometimes the mane sticks up. They have this dark face with kind of an, an arched um, muzzle. Corner, corners, corners, corners. The leg is doing what we sort of expected before. Sort of here's your body, back leg doing that, front leg doing that. Notice that the location of the heel in our dogs, cats, hyenas was down much closer to the ground. And on these sorts of, um, on, on, on wildebeest, on, on, on e even toed animals, ungulates and things, it's often much more kind of in the middle of that leg. So this might be leg positioning for a, uh, a wildebeest. Um, and this might be something that you'd see, you know, in your lion. So I'm going to walk through what my approach to drawing this critter would be in a moment. Um, before I do, let's just. Um, Let's make a quick one minute sketch of this. So a one minute sketch, so this is gonna be fast, light, loose. No detail, but just see if what you could, how you would kind of go about blocking in the major shape that you're looking at here. What would, what would your approach be? And, and play with that. In a lot of these blocking in stages, I often find that straight lines um, are great for kind of carving out a form. You kind of pretend that you're an architect going. And if you're watching at home, have a piece of paper, do the same thing, just draw, make a quick one minute sketch. I know you can pause it, keep it there, but don't. One minute sketch. Do you need twenty more seconds? Let, let me show you not the right way to do it, but how I might kind of break apart drawing a critter like this. Again, my first focus of my attention is what is the line around along the neck and the back? And I'll draw that in. This one is going to have its head down. There's a big bump on its back. And then here's my belly in the ground. I want to get my negative shape to tie into the point of this big hump. Um, if I just now draw my negative shape, I could draw that over here and over here, and it's not going to line up with that hump. So I'm going to put a post in where my front leg is, and I'm going to see where that goes relative to that hump. What that does is it ties in the bottom part of your drawing with the top. So there's the post. And I'm going to stitch my negative shape onto the back of that post. So I put this in just to sort of to see like where where does that front leg go relative to the back. And then I'm going to draw my negative shape on the back side of it. Now what I'm doing is just instead of thinking kind of angles and shapes, 
I'm looking at the masses of meat. I'm kind of thinking like a lion, like, ooh, I would like to eat that part, right? And I'm seeing this as this big ball of tissue. And then saying, all right, yeah, you got a big kind of rumpy thing here, you got a big belly going on here, little here, and you know, whatever those, those, those parts are, I'm kind of chunking in masses of bulky tissue. But notice that that's a kind of a shift mentally from what we've been doing before, kind of looking at, we weren't looking at the masses of the body, we're looking at the spaces that were next to it. And the next thing, there will be a big jump between this and the next stage. Um, but this is the framework on top of which I hang my details. So you can then put down your, 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 your light pencil or your non-photo blue pencil and start to draw your critter over the top of that. But because you have already blocked in the proportions, you can now focus on the detail of the nostril and that nostril is gonna be in the right place. If you started drawing your nostril before the proportions, you'd get a great nostril, but then all the rest of it would not be the right shape. So that's why I'm kind of moving from those general forms into the details. The details, kind of carving that out, comes later in the drawing. Let's go under the hood a little bit more and just review what's going on here underneath the skin. What joint is this one? That one right there. Yep. What is this one? Yeah, that's, that's the hip. Yeah, that's the hip. So here's my pelvis, and there's my hip. So that means this is the knee. And you can see the knee cap right there. This is heel. Yeah, the ankle or the heel. Alright, well, I guess the ankle joint are pretty joints. So there's the ankle or the heel. This is the heel bone sticking off. This long bone right here is all those metatarsal bones across the foot, those long skinny bones in the middle of the foot. If somebody steps on your instep, right, that hurts. They're fused together in even-toed animals into this big column. And notice that this part and this part, right, very similar in length. On this guy, our heel was down here. Now our heel is all the way up here on our leg. Before, our wrist was all the way down here. We had a big forearm from the elbow to the forearm. Now that's in the middle. So that when I put the skin on top of this, I have this joint here, I have this joint here. Looking at skeletons is really, really helpful. The more that you do it, what's going to happen is your brain will kind of, at first it's just like, I just, like, I have no idea what's going on with you. But then you're going to be able to look at an animal and sort of imagine what is happening underneath the skin. Getting a diagram of a skeleton and looking at a real critter or a photograph of a critter is a very useful thing. Drawing on top of a, like you go on, on YouTube, pull up a picture of any critter and then print that out and then draw on top of that what you think the bones are doing underneath the skin. There are going to be some places where you get a very clear landmark of what one of these joints is. And other places where you're going to be like, so under here, like, what's going on with, with that neck? Like, everybody thinks that the neck is coming in here. These guys, to increase their kind of angularity, look at how high the eye is in this head, too. It's way up there. That's weird. They've got these manes and beards. And so on these, sometimes the beard kind of collects in a little dewlap down like this. 
or they're fanned out more. Um, but what this tends to do is makes the front part of the body feel really big and blocky on these guys. So it just looks like they are all front loaded, and they are. Think about how much weight this leg has to carry versus this one. Good reason to lock that leg out and keep it straight. So you start drawing one of these guys, it'll feel just, it'll feel off balance. In coloring them, whether I'm doing watercolor or colored pencil, I often will put the shadow in first and then drop the color on top of that. The final thing that makes these guys sort of completes the wildebeest, but also kind of adds to the degree of visual confusion. When you look at a wildebeest photo, it will be like, what's going on here? Because it has these sort of ragged stripes across its shoulder and neck here. And see how that makes this sort of visually much more confusing? What's going on here structurally? This is a lot easier. And the minute you put in all of this business, uh, it becomes it becomes visually confusing. So training yourself to, when you look at something, how can I kind of understand the anatomy, start with those simpler shapes, that will help you be able to draw your happy little wildebeest. So that being said, here's a wildebeest for us to draw. Let's give this a try. So this wildebeest is gonna be here for about four minutes. And what we wanna do is sort of start just trying to block in this basic shape. Um, if you are watching this on the video at home, um, you can pause it right now and then um, continue on when you're ready. But just having seen those, those thoughts, see what you can do to kind of draw in this basic shape. Um, also, what you can do is just kind of go on, do a Google image search for wildebeest. Images will pop up and pick one that you like and give that a try. Two more minutes with this wildebeest.
before I move on from the slide, just to kind of point out when I think about masses of tissue, I often think about this, you know, the big haunches here as being a big pulpy mass. The mass around the front shoulder is smaller because it's not having, this needs big muscles for locomotion. This is stability on straight legs, doesn't need to be as big. And then there's the, the guts of this thing as sort of big, sort of rounded masses that often pop into the sketches. So if you're out in the Serengeti, this is how you're going to see the wildebeest. Um, it's not a wildebeest, it's wildebeests. They're in, in a herd, and they will sometimes be from, you know, stretch from where you are to the horizon, in huge, huge numbers. Uh, it's one of the, the great spectacles, uh, wildlife spectacles, uh, still happening on this planet, if we can um, continue to preserve and protect them. Um, so if you're drawing a wildebeest, uh, you're going to start your sketch, and then what's going to happen is the wildebeest is going to turn. It's going to move. Um, so what do you do if you want to continue your sketch? Yeah, the one right next to it is in the old pose, so you can just jump over to that. So drawing things in a herd, you know, like you want to keep you know, like this left view and the critter turns, then just kind of go over to the next one that's doing that. Um, so what's going to happen is you're going to get, let's say here's your wildebeest. You draw your wildebeest. Then what you do is you pick a different pose, and here's this other wildebeest over here. And and what I'm doing is I'm putting their, making them about the same size, and I'm putting their backs at about the same height as well. I'm going to have another wildebeest over here, with its tail kind of swishing over here. Um, and then over here is going to be another wildebeest. So I draw these in with their backs at the same height. And then, notice that here's a group of wildebeest, as they're traveling around the herds, they're these, they're in these herds, there are these subgroups. Here's another group, here's another group, here's another group, here's another group back here. What I do is I then jump higher on the page, and from another line, I'm going to hang the backs of the next group. Here's, here's one here, here's the next over here. Right. Here's the next over here. And then behind that are even smaller ones. So think of several things. One is um, the backs are at the same height. All right. Number two, um, as you go up, wow, that was go up. This is fun when dyslexics write. So you got when you got um, equals uh, smaller. Right. So you're getting smaller as you go up the page. The backs are staying at the same height. And also reduce the amount of detail in the ones as you get further back. And what you'll get is a scene of this herd of wildebeest kind of tromping around and doing whatever they're doing together. Um, and you can do this, you don't have to like keep track of like, okay, for, let's say I go up, you know, two inches, then how much smaller should I make my wildebeest? You don't have to do any of those kinds of calculations because the spacing between these lines is just dependent on the slope of the ground that they're on. So if you have, I'm going to do two drawings here. All right, so first one, here are my wildebeest. And second one has you know, wildebeest also like that. This, this one here, if, it's at a, if you're either higher up looking down on these, or the ground is at a slope, right, here's my next group of wildebeest. Right, they're a little bit smaller. Right, and then back here, there are these ones back here. I'm going to make these guys a little bit bigger. 
you could also have the next row of wildebeest be here. And these ones back here. Both of these are correct. It's just that this one would be on flatter ground or your point of view is lower towards the herd. Here you climbed up on top of your safari vehicle and you're looking back on, on these things um, uh, going out that way. And then you draw in the horizon, right? throw in the acacia tree, and you've just drawn the Serengeti. Um, but consider making a composite picture. Now these could be even some zebras back here. Of, of what you get, and um, that's that's a lot of fun. But it starts with start start with like one focal wildebeest, and then build out from there. One last question on this: If the backs are getting higher as you as the critters are getting smaller, right? Why is it that these? Uh, wildebeest right here are their backs are, are, are lower. These are, seem to be heads the same size as that one. Are they in a crevice? Or same thing is happening with these ones right here. Why are those heads at different levels? They're laying down. So here's your Resting wildebeest, and it can be on the same level as this wildebeest here, and its head will be at different height if it's laying down. So just so that's during drawing the herd. Another thing that comes in groups are vultures. And if you have been, um, the vultures in the old world are ridiculously cool. Um, they have, look at this, this is a neck here. This neck of this thing is coming down like this, right? And it's got this body here, right? This is this incredibly long, sort of turkey-necked vulture. Um, You've seen these, uh, if you live in, in uh, North America, you've seen these uh, countless times, but only in cartoons. Um, in, uh, in, in kids' cartoons, because these long neck vultures look so cool, they're always kind of the, the vulture shape that they put in. And sometimes people will draw, you know, the saguaro cactus. Here's the saguaro. And you know, sitting on that, you know, is, you know, <laughs> here's the, the vulture. There's only one problem with that drawing. Does anybody know what it is? What is the biogeographical problem of the old world vulture on a cactus? Cactus are new world. These vultures are, are old world. So just like you can't have a drawing with an ice flow with a polar bear on it, kind of looking at the penguin, right? Because that's Antarctica and the North Pole um, to, you know, coming together. You can't have your vulture sitting on your cactus like that. Um, New World vulture, yeah, with a little neck, little turkey vulture or black vulture up there, sure. But not those long neck vultures. So let's take, uh, these guys will, can appear, will appear just like magic the moment something dies, they're covered with vultures, and they're incredibly efficient. They get in there, like, nom, 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 and nothing's left. Except a few bones for the jackals to gnaw on. Um, what's going on is that early in the morning, the vultures get up, and they fly up on thermals, so they don't have to flap their huge, huge, huge wings. Um, and then they just fly around up there, they're looking for dead things. And of course, if they see a dead thing, then they start dropping down on it. But here's the neat thing. The other vultures, they're looking for dead things as well, but they're also keeping an eye out on the other vultures. So if I'm a vulture and I see my neighbor over there starting to go down at a vector like that, 
I will set my wings and come in so that I'm going to encounter the ground at the same location that they do. Then this vulture over here sees me doing that, and then that vulture comes in. So what happens as one vulture responds to this vulture that's responding to this vulture, they, it's just like pulling in this giant vulture net, and they all descend on this one spot and just can skeletonize something very, very quickly. Really neat heads. But if you're used to um, turkey vultures and things, it's going to be a very, very confusing shape. I want to point out something neat about the neck here. The neck vertebrae of these things um, is coming down, hitting the neck on this side, and then coming back up in here. So the, uh, on the front, you are getting an angle here where the neck vertebrae touch it, and then a curve on the back. So very often, like you see on herons and egrets, you'll see a curve on one side and a sharp angle on the other. Um, so that's just, so just don't draw the necks like garden hoses. Um, they will be bending at specific places. There'll be more bend than other places. There'll also be angles partnered with curves. So those are just good things to look at on the necks themselves. If you're looking at the beastie and you've spent a lot of time studying wing anatomy, these wings become really confusing. Because if you've you know, studied your little songbirds and you're used to, all right, songbirds have this you know, block of, of um, secondary feathers and then the primary feathers tuck up underneath that and there's a primary, the allula and the primary coverts. Um, you've studied all your kind of wing parts and then you look at this block here. And it is really weird, really confusing. So what am I looking at? This is all secondaries. So it's a big block of secondaries and secondary coverts. Um, so small feathers in rows of coverts giving way to this final long row of secondaries. Where are the primaries? It's not that they don't have them, they have long primaries. But the hand has the primaries attached to it. The hand has tucked up underneath these feathers like that. And the primaries are diagonally folded up underneath here, out of your view. Sometimes completely invisible. In this case, you see a little tiny triangle right here. I think that's probably all we're seeing of the primaries in this bird. These are tail feathers sticking out here. So there's that big block of secondaries. They have a chicken-like body in here. Um, and so they've got a shoulder, an elbow, a wrist, and a hand. And all of that is covered up by those feathers. So as a little task here, what I'd like you to do is just take a look at this and see if for you, if you're to kind of make a diagram of this and to sort of boil this down into the, a minimal number of simple geometric shapes and put them together to kind of, in a little icon, represent vultureness, what would you do? Sort of draw that out. Don't worry about getting lost in detail and feathers, but what are you seeing as the major components of it? How would you kind of construct this thing? Draw that out. So for me, if I'm looking at this, what I'm thinking about is a big diagonal box of those secondaries. 
And sticking out on top of that is a little triangle of these back feathers. It kind of comes into this cool little ruff. And our head sticks out from that. On the legs, there's a little poof of feathers and a little bit of foot coming down. If this turns towards me more, what I'm going to get is that box of feathers on the side. I'm going to get a little bit of belly sticking out there, and I'm going to see part of the box of the other wing, its shoulder, kind of sticking out. Really, really fun birds. These necks are great. And you're going to see the same sorts of thing, shapes going on in flamingo necks. Um, but they're, if you spend a lot of time drawing heron and egret necks, these will be particularly confusing for it to you because the heron and egret neck have more of those kind of kinks and angles. The last thing we're going to do before we wrap here is just take a look at zebras. Even though they're not ugly. They're weird. Um, and we all have an idea in our head of what, of how the zebra should be looking. Um, and we know there are stripes on them, but where exactly do those stripes go? So make yourself a simple little kind of cartoon drawing of the body. And on that, just lay out how you think the stripes should go. What is the pattern of stripes that you see on a zebra? If you're looking at this at home, don't cheat and look it up yet. But it's neat to sort of see that how your brain thinks that the stripes should go. The reason you want to do this exercise is that it's going to be different. So I did this exercise on my own, thinking like, I know zebra, right? And I kind of mapped out, I think it's doing this, and I was totally wrong. Um, and so unless you've specifically dialed in on this, um, this is gonna be confusing and weird. And it's gonna be different than what you're expecting, but you want to kind of be aware of the way that your brain currently is thinking that it should be, because that wrong information will try to creep into your drawing. Um, so if instead we kind of block in, uh, we kind of are aware of what we think, it'll be, we'll be better able to replace that with different information if we're really clear and articulate about the way we think it looks right now. So give me a thumbs up when you've got your zebra basically blocked in. You don't have to draw this up. So we've got one thumb and we're good to go. You ready for it? You ready to, for the reveal? All right. How is this different than what you thought? So what are big places that it's different? On the side. Um, in here? Yes, the rump and the side. Yeah. The, so the rump and the side. So yeah, here we're going horizontal. Yeah. What's with that? I mean, we, it's supposed to be like prison bars, right? Here, just try to take your hand and cover up the back part of the zebra for a moment. And look at that very consistent front of the zebra. Now you look at the back part of the zebra, and it looks like it was done by a totally different design team. Mm -hmm. right? There was no communication on how to color in the zebra, and this team just did it a totally different way at that. Um, Drawing in these stripes, it's really easy to get lost in there. But there is a secret to drawing zebra strips. 
and there are three stripes and if you can place these three stripes the rest of the stripes will be a lot easier by the way each zebra has its own unique pattern of stripes they follow the same general trends and rules but they're each one is going to be different. So if yours doesn't look exactly like the zebra that's in front of you, do you just tell somebody else, oh, I was just drawing a different zebra. <laughs> right? But there are three stripes on here. Which three stripes are, the, are going to be, it's one of the ones that are sort of, like if you had that one and that one mapped in, it would really help you be able to block in your zebra. That's a critical stripe right there. Boom. If you have that stripe, then this, and it's the dividing line. It makes a distinction that there's something going on here, here, and there. Right? So here are the, the, the stripes that I think are going to be kind of those, those, those critical ones. Um, there's one kind of wrapping around the front of the muzzle. There's this upside down Y coming down and separating over the shoulder. And then there's this vertical Y coming up in the middle of the body, a little bit more towards the front than the back, going straight up and arching to a Y back. If you have the placement of those three, you can draw your zebra. From there, it's just going to be kind of drawing in. If you don't get the exact number of strikes right, that's fine. This is also weird. It looks like there's an earthquake fault that came along and broke this stripe. That one's slightly off center. But you know, there's an old San Andreas fault line right in there. Um, so if you don't get like this one, okay, it comes up and then it's it's dividing and then it's kind of coming over here, and it's like the, if you're kind of lost in that, so that's not the kind of level of resolution that you want. You want to be thinking that this one does this. This one does this, this one does this, right? If you, and the reason that, you, that you, you kind of get those, you look at a different zebra, there will be stripe patterns in here that kind of take up these same roles, but they're going to be a slightly different shape. So look at this zebra, right? So here's the Y one coming up straight and arching back. But look at how different it is than this one, right? Here's coming down and turning into a Y. On this one, it comes down, and then there's a broken one over here. So I would take that one and that little stripe over there. And then this is a nice, simple curve around here, separating those two sides. And then you can make a white space coming in from the bottom. You can make a white space coming in from the top. So some of them fork and Y in both directions. So look at this. Here's white coming in. Here's black coming into the white. Here's white coming into the black. Um, and that can happen all over the place. Let's go back to this one. So you see that happening here, here, right? This one is Y. Um, so what you can do is, instead of getting lost on which stripe you're on, you get the location of Oh, that still works. You get the location of those basic dividers, and as long as you're kind of regularly kind of popping up, you can kind of generally get these patterns. As you're going down on the legs, we're getting smaller, we're getting closer together. Larger on the neck, smaller on the cheek. Right? But you don't have to be copying it line for line for line, unless you're trying to kind of mimic the specific thumbprint of an individual zebra. But generally, as, you're, as these things are walking around in front of you, that's going to be hard to do because it's not going to be a photograph. It's a moving zebra. And you're like, well, I was, was I on this line or this line? Your brain is going to go, I have no idea. One last thing that zebras love to do, you start to draw them, they will invariably give you the zebra butt shape. Right? So, spending some time thinking about and drawing a couple of zebra butts. Um, it's good to kind of have zebra butt on your radar because this is, this is what they will regularly show you.
Um, let's say out loud some observations about this pattern. What do you notice about this pattern? How do you describe it? Symmetrical. Symmetrical, okay. yeah. They seem to be in pairs. And they're roughly symmetrical, right? This one has wine, this one isn't. It's not a total mirror image. Anything else? Narrower on the legs. Good. Good, 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 good. Narrower on the legs. That nice. Look at look at the how this comes down. Check out these two just kind of coming over the top. That's zebra butt. <laughs> right? Why don't we um, just make a quick little diagram, kind of a cartoon diagram of the generic zebra butt. So the next time a zebra flashes this view to you, you'll kind of know where to start. On your diagram, Add in some written notes, little tag labels about the patterns that you're seeing. So make it a full diagram, not just a little drawing. Add in some written notes with that. And you'll find that that helps you be able to record more information more precisely and succinctly. There are several different uh, kinds of zebras, that, and they have slightly different patterns on them. But we've been looking at the sort of zebras that you find in the Serengeti, the grants. And that is the end. <laughs> so what you want to do with this information is to go home and give me 10 sketches of um, ugly, odd-shaped critters. And these can be quick sketches or longer drawings, but 10 separate drawings of sort of like strange oddities of beasties. And see if you can look at them hard enough that they're no longer ugly, but you start to see the beauty in these kind of wonderful and exotic body forms. Um, the most important thing is practice and kind of getting this to be you're sort of training your eye and your brain to link up with your fingers. The more you do that, the better it will come. Um, but these little kind of ways of looking at some of these odd-shaped, interesting critters will help you with drawing whatever it is that you're looking at. So if you were to extract three different lessons from today, three different kind of nuggets of drawing that you wanted to remember, what, um, what would you pick? If, you, if your brain would wipe everything else clear and you just wanted to keep three things, what would that what would one of them be for you? Negative space for placement of life. All right. That that's a really big one. Um, and you will no longer get those sort of snosh or those the, the big problem I think but I see most often is people have really nicely drawn legs, but they're just way too close together. All right. That's great. So negative space really helps your crater legs. What's another one? Because then you know, it just looks like a dust bunny. Yeah. But you're drawing the pelt. You're drawing the pelt. You're drawing the fur. And give me one more. The skeletal framework of each animal and how it helps you frame in the space. Great. Finding skeletons, looking at skeletons, along with looking at pictures, photographs, or live critters is terrific. 
Um, if you've got a pet at home or on your farm, um, a great exercise is to, um, you know, you can pat your dog, you can give your doggy a massage. And as you're doing, you're feeling like, oh, that's this joint, oh, that's this joint here. So go kind of feel around, and they're gonna think it's great. It's like, oh yeah, that's the spot, that's the spot. And you're going like, all right, so that's, that's the end, that's where this joint kind of ticks, and then that's gonna go from here, and you can even move their little legs for them. Your cats will swipe at you, right? But dogs will tend just to sit there and kind of go like, oh, this is so good. Yeah. Okay. yeah, 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 you're giving me attention. You're alpha, I love you, I love you, all right? Um, and this stuff will become intuitive and become yours.